All right. So it was just November 2021 when metaverse became a new buzzword. Mark Zuckerberg wanted to distract us from the crap job Facebook was doing regulating misinformation. So he introduced his new company name, Meta and the metaverse. Uh, not too much fun fanfare, actually. But ever since we've been talking about the metaverse, what is this thing? Is it a new concept or is it just something that... Uh, we're recycling because, you know, Silicon Valley likes to recycle things over and over and over again. So while we're putting a check on Metaverse, can we also check in on crypto too? Because a lot happened last year. Uh, for these two topics, I have my longtime friend, uh, Chris Voltz. Chris and I went to graduate school at Berkeley together. So, you know, he's super smart. He's a software engineer who has worked at some awesome companies like Electronic Arts, Capital One, and now DOMA. And importantly for this conversation on the metaverse, he worked at Linden Labs, creator of the popular game and virtual world Second Life. But first, welcome to this week's episode of Make Sense, a video podcast that simplifies complex issues at the intersection of tech and people. So whether you're totally hyped on artificial intelligence and ready for the robot takeover, some of you are, or you want to crawl into a cave after deleting all of your social media accounts, I know the feeling. I'm here with my guests to help make sense of what's going on in the world of tech so you can design yourself into the future. My name is Lindsay Tabus. I'm a product market fit strategist and innovation advisor. I've always been obsessed with designing tech for people. So let's get started. Chris, I have not seen you since 2019 yeah. and this is probably the first time we're talking synchronously in just as long so how the hell are you well you know it's uh i am one of those rare people who actually kind of thrived during the pandemic did you yeah it was great how I, did you thrive <laughs> um i i bought a place i um congrats yeah um uh, i got two cats amazing uh, um i started uh cooking more at home which has been great for my health and Wonderful. Uh, yeah it i mean i don't see anyone so that kind of stuff <laughs> but everything else is trending up <laughs> trending upwards is how i've talked about being self-employed for the past nine years you know just some years you don't have a lot to report on so you're just like trending up <laughs> um I've actually been dying to have this conversation for well over a year because when I heard Mark Zuckerberg start talking about the metaverse, I was like, isn't this just second life? And like, what the hell is the difference? <laughs> what am I missing here? So I'm very lucky that you agreed to record this conversation with me. What is the difference? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so. I think probably one big caveat is that because um, uh, the metaverse is primarily available through Oculus, I actually haven't been able to log in. Like I've seen videos, I've done reading about it, um, but I haven't actually been able to play with it, um, at least not, not personally. Um, but yeah, in terms of like, I think what it's trying to do, it seems very similar to Second Life, maybe a little prettier. Um, but probably less interesting. Well, um. Probably. I mean, a lot of, a lot of interesting things happened on Second Life. So let's take a step back for anyone that, you know, wasn't paying attention to virtual worlds 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, what, can you just describe Second Life? Yeah. So so Second Life, and you know, I worked there for three and a half years, thereabouts. Um, very, very, very firm. It is not a game. It is an online virtual world. And when you're in it, it's true because like there's no points. Like you can't win Second Life. There are <laughs> there are like people created like like the, there are creator made games that you can do within Second Life. Um. But yeah, th there's no point other than to like go in and like build stuff and explore and just sort of like make neat things and hopefully like discover neat things. Uh, that was one of the um, really awesome parts about working there was that people would just do crazy stuff and, and you sort of stumble onto things and you're like, wow, this is really, really cool. Yeah. So and like, 
what kinds of people were hanging out in Second Life at the time? Yeah. Um, so there, there have been a couple of, of different um, ways, and you know, maybe, maybe we actually should, should before we get there, before we get into like Second Life itself, it, it's maybe worth taking one more big step back to sort of like the origin of the idea of this sort of metaverse second life thing because second a life virtual itself, world right yeah because second life itself didn't like spring out of nothing like it there, there were you know prior prior art there, there's um i mean we've had imaginary worlds forever you yeah. know right dungeons and dragons is an imaginary world right mm -hmm. it's not necessarily manifested in 3d digital renderings right yeah well and even you know if you go back to some of the um old massively multiplayer rpgs the same sort of thing where um they were they were open worlds in the sense that you could sort of, sort of explore everywhere but they were they were still confined by what right. the game designers wanted right um and I, I, I should have looked this up before we, we got on the call, but I think the, the real origin of metaverse as we're talking about it today and, and as Second Life envisioned it really started with the book Snow Crash uh, by Neil Stevenson. Um, and it had like this big intersection between like physical world where things happened, you know, in reality and then um, a digital equivalent and, uh, how people would sort of navigate seamlessly between those two and how the digital equivalent was no less real in some pretty fundamental ways. And, and that's kind of what I think Second Life was trying to, to accomplish. Okay, and Second Life, you know, when, when what I've learned over the past year was when, when Facebook talks about the metaverse, yes, it's all rendered in the Oculus, mm -hmm. which is why they lost like over $10 billion last year is because I'm very certain that like the general population, the bell curve of the general population is like not ready for like the Oculus and having their own thing. But when we talk about metaverse, you know, broadly speaking, not just in Facebook, we're talking about 3D rendered yeah. virtual worlds that you can interact with through your phone, through your laptop, you don't need any special glasses. And mm -hmm. that's kind of, that's how everyone was interacting with Second Life, right? 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, within Second Life, um, the, you know, they, they didn't have like a, a mobile version because, man. We like, didn't have smartphones at the time. The only smartphones yeah. at the time were the Blackberry and that thing was definitely not rendering. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh you know when you first broached this uh topic and conversation to me a few weeks back i was like i started just thinking back about how much things have changed over the last 15 20 years and it still boggles my mind um um yeah so this predates my time at, at second life but when second life was first sort of like imagined the the goal actually was to have a um like a 3d view and, and they didn't mm -hmm. know what they looked like that technology really didn't exist yet but mm -hmm. the original the original idea was to have some sort of 3d perspective and to actually have some sort of uh tactile response so you could actually physically manipulate things and um and, and they'd done some like experimental um you know hardware hacking of, of creating like uh, machinery to make that happen, but obviously as big as clunky is really just sort of a proof of concept. Right. Um, but when when Second Life started, it was uh, kind of like a game, like you had a, a client, and um, it would render the world, um, uh, do your rendering, and and you just go in and you start making your character, and then you start interacting with people, and. Yeah, the uh, you know it started out small and then just slowly snowballed. Um, you asked about what people were attracted to to Second Life. What types of people were attracted to it, and then what were they attracted to? The um, 
besides porn, because we know yeah. like I was about to is, I was about to ask how adult should this conversation get? I mean, mm-hmm. like everyone should know when you're talking about like, you know, cutting edge technologies and the first, you know, groups to kind of co-op it before media and capitalism takes over. Porn has it has it yeah. shot first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I um, think, is porn the great like catalyst for technology adoption? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> arguably, like <laughs> you know, you know your technology big time when you when those sites start coming up. You're like, all but right. Then, but then also, like the you know, we talked about this. In, it, it a concept came from grad school, but it it, it obviously continues to come up but like when it comes to like user adoption it's a bell curve right and you have mm-hmm. your early adopters on the left side these or like i talk in my startup world like early evangelists the ones that'll use your crappy software and be excited about it because you're solving a problem for them mm-hmm. and at some point there becomes like adoption in the general population so if if you think about it you know like originally you know the iphone and smartphones in general, it, you know, while they came out, uh, like the iPhone specifically, like 2008, 2009, mm-hmm. even at 2011, only 12 to 15% of the population had smartphones. And now it's like more pervasive than the PC. So yeah. with when it comes to any technology, experiential technologies, it's like after the real geeks have their shot at it, like the thing that gets the technology probably in front of the bell curve, right? Mm -hmm. Like approaching the peak of the bell curve is porn. Like the average Joe is not hearing about it (laughs) until they find it. Yeah. (laughs) Through porn. And and, and Second Life, (laughs) Second Life had kind of a similar trend, um, but also I think some really interesting differences. Okay, so back up. The original yeah. question was, what types of people were attracted to it, and what were they attracted to? Yeah, so uh, you know, as you just said, you have the early adopters, and these are people who um, really just wanted to play with the new thing. And, and this yeah. was new. This was yeah. like the the ability to have a persistent online three D virtual world that you could screw around in, make up, make your own stuff. Um, and completely customizable. That was pretty revolutionary. Yeah. And people started. Yeah, you had had the tech evangelists. You had you had the the nerds and the geeks who are like, I want to play with this. And I I think following a lot of like early adopters, people play with it for a week or two, and then they move on to something else. But the people who don't, the people who stick around, they keep building and, and making you know the 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 neat stuff. Right. Um. The one thing that I think really helped Second Life's growth was actually the communities that it facilitated. Um, Because a lot, the user growth of of Second Life is interesting. And and, and my my knowledge is maybe a little bit dated to like 2012, 2013. Um, But if people had like really gotten into, into Second Life, they were very sticky. Like mm-hmm. they would, they would keep showing up, and they would, they would log in, you know, twenty hours a week or more. Um, but then you had the dilettantes who'd show up, check it out, and and those numbers were quite high. But then there wasn't anything to um, keep really them. Keep them, yeah, to keep them to there wasn't a, a compelling argument for them to be like, I want to keep doing this. Um, and this is where I think communities got really important, um, because, and it's no secret. But there were a number of like fetish communities that joined Second Life early on. And the reason they did is because these were the sort of, you know, social groups that you maybe didn't have a lot of numbers around um, around you. And even if you did, they might be hard to find. And even if they weren't hard to find, maybe you didn't actually want to be there in person. Like maybe you still had like reasons you didn't want to, um, you know, out yourself. Um, and Second Life made that kind of irrelevant. You were able to get online and um, interact with people who, frankly, were just into the same stuff you were into, and um, and that proved to be uh, really, really sticky. And you know, like I said, it started with some fetish groups, but like it it grew. There there were a lot of groups who 
weren't who were no longer bound by geography. Right. Well, any any sub interest groups that fit what you described, you know, hard to find, like minded, mm -hmm. potentially fringe things that were conservative or taboo to talk about at, at that time or even mm -hmm. even now, you know, those groups are finding themselves online and in the in these virtual spaces where they have more ability to express themselves, right? Yeah. So well, okay. Yeah, and and you know it eventually grew to like all sorts of interest groups. Like you're into model trains. I've always had a model train thing, cool. and it was actually they're like, and and you know that's a group that is not big and is very geographically dispersed. Mm -hmm. Um, and Second Life is like, hey, let's talk about trains because. The people who are into trains are really into trains. Yeah. Right. So, um, and then, like, by the time I joined, there, it also had kind of moved, moved into just, um, there was also a significant number of people who just had a more casual community of just, like, hanging out. And, and this kind of went back to, like, you know, I said Second Life isn't, isn't a game, but there were games in Second Life. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the earlier ones that I remember was a, um, it was like a Tamagotchi type of thing where I think it, it was either ducks or chickens. And I wish I can't remember which, <laughs> but, um, you would, um, you know, get a couple chickens and they would breed and make new chickens. And then you could selectively breed them to get extremely rare, desirable traits. And uh, and Second Life had had created an in-world economy, so you could buy and sell your extremely rare chickens, and um, people were pretty fanatic about it. They invest a lot of time in in building their their stable of fancy digital chickens. But they they did this out of fun. They didn't do the an entertainment. They didn't do this as like to make a living or anything, did they? There were, I mean, I, I don't think the numbers were huge, but there were people who were using the economy within Second Life as their primary source of income. Wow. Um, and and because I think the other thing that Lyndon did that was really, really smart is they made their own currency and it had an exchange rate, a floating exchange rate to the U.S. dollar. Okay. So the, the Lyndon dollar would go up and down and... Um, you could, if you were generating value in your second life thing, and people wanted to buy your stuff, um, you would accrue Linden. You could cash those out for U.S. dollars. Wow. Um, wow, wow, wow. I didn't know that yeah. part. So now here's the question. Does is, is second life exist anymore in any incarnation? It does. Um, I don't know what state it's in. So a few years after I left, um, they, they had done a lot of work to make it prettier. Uh, so so the, the pictures I've seen from it since then um, look like it's actually still quite, like there's some very beautiful creations in there. Um, uh, I don't know, when I was there, they were really struggling with making the tools easy to use. Mm. Um, you know, the Second Life was a, a weird place because like, who's, who's the competitor to Second Life? And there were a couple of like, 3D-ish world things like INVU, I think, was a thing. Yeah. I mean, but, those are direct competitors, but well, anything else that takes entertainment, time, and connection, like anything else yeah. that offers entertainment or connection and community is a competitor, even if it's not a virtual world. Yeah. I, I would argue that what actually proved to be the biggest competitor, which kind of did both, was Minecraft. Interesting. Uh, uh, I mean, it did get a lot more kids uh, yeah. than the adults. Second Life definitely um, uh, was an adults. Only it was not adults only, and and they it's did adults mostly. Yeah, it, but they they did try to make kid friendly spaces uh, yeah. that were moderated and and had like community guidelines that that could be enforced. Um, but Minecraft, you know. It wasn't as pretty as Second Life, but it was a lot easier to use, and it kind of 
uh, scratched that itch of wanting to build things, and um, and it didn't, you know, it had its like built-in like adventures and you know, the sure. skeletons and stuff like that, sure. which made it a little like it gave it a little bit of a purpose at first. Um, so here's the question: Is if that is what Second Life was a decade ago, and and change, mm-hmm. like what people talk about today as the metaverse or the possibility of the metaverse, is it any different? So this is what I'm trying to figure out with Facebook's metaverse thing. Yeah. Um, Because they're trying to figure it out too. They spent over $10 billion trying to figure. (laughs) And, and, and to be clear, Linden Lamb took longer, but they spent way less money. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so I do think Oculus is now, like, it, it's still a little rare thing. Like, I don't have one, though I know people who do, and I've played with them, and it is compelling. It's a neat thing. Um, and I think that will prove um, to be useful for what um, Meb is trying to do around it. But they're, it, it still looks like they're doing the same thing. Yeah. Right? Like. It, it feels like there's, it's still a, a technology looking for a problem mm-hmm. that the general population has to solve, right? Yeah. Like it feels like they're, it's still a technology in search of a problem. Like we could yeah. be using it. And I wrote a LinkedIn post today about the possibilities of how we could use it for online retail or how we could use it for connecting with coworkers. But to the majority of the general population, that center bell curve, Mm -hmm. I really feel like not much more people are ready for it now as it was 10 years ago when Second Life existed. So... You mentioned two things there, which I, I think are worth calling out. One is, you know, how 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 could Meta's metaverse, you know, be useful to people? And, and you mentioned retail. Retail went into Second Life. Um, they had, you know, storefronts within Second Life where people could, you know, is it, basically it was clunky, and mm-hmm. I don't think metaverse is going to be less clunky. But, um, uh, you know, you wanted to go shopping for for things you could just walk down aisles of virtual uh hallway and look at it but like how is that better or easier than just going to a website yeah Um, yeah and then then you mentioned virtual presence and this was this is actually kind of interesting particularly given you know the last three years and the proliferation of, of remote work um so linden had a very they were not remote first but um, as a company, but they they were distributed office first. So they had offices all over the place. Sometimes it would be someone from working home. Sometimes it would just be like 10 people in an office or whatever. Um, and we didn't have Zoom, but we had Second Life. Mm-hmm. And so almost all of our meetings were held in World. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of fun because you like, I was a, a little uh, robot zombie doctor uh, for, for much of my time there. Um, there were, and there'd be like, you know, robots and animals and people and rock stars yeah. and all that sort of stuff. And so that was kind of cool, a little distracting, um, but it was kind of cool. But like, but you're would... even though you're a skeptic, you are a, tend to be an early adopter of like tech. You're a tinkerer, right? You're I, yeah, gonna I, it out, you're going to figure it out. And you worked for the company, and so I just am wondering if you were doing that, and you know late 2000s early or mm-hmm. 2010s like is the average joe that like works yeah you know for a, a 2000 person company gonna is are they ready for that right now like i i well, think that meta is trying to force the metaverse yeah down a lot of people's i i think you'll be proven correct about that and i will I will also say that, like, once I left Linden, I haven't been into Second Life very much. Yeah. Um, 
and you know i'm certainly not holding meetings there we're not yeah. doing this video call in February. yeah <laughs> um, and and what i think zoom proved uh is that you know the video conferencing is now far enough along that it's easy people there there's like some early days of like trying to figure out like what the new social norms are around it but adoption was pretty quick partly because right. we had to like we had to adjust right but it was also the technology was at a point where it was easy enough and pervasive enough that it wasn't and it and it had a very like obvious value yeah to it, it it also solved an immediate problem yeah and uh and i think right now we're still there's there's uh, the immediate problems for generally the metaverse, not just Meta's version of the metaverse, but like immersive virtual worlds, whether you're consuming them in a flat screen or an Oculus, there are applications for that. I've seen some really cool startups, you know, that are working on training first responders. Mm -hmm. Like then, you know, maybe there's remote areas where they can take, you know, video cartography, files and put them into immersive experience to help train and stuff like that um that's not the same because i guess that's more ar right than vr but kind of but anyway by splitting hairs there i don't want to yeah. i want to make sense of things not make it more complex but i i guess <laughs> the the thing is is like we there are some applications on the fringes um, but uh, Mark Zuckerberg's attempt to make metaverse a common thing in pop culture with the general population over 2022 was largely a failure. Uh, and I think that most people around me, um, tech or not tech, are still struggling to see where like a virtual world and virtual spaces would help them in yeah. day to day or be a preferred way to connect over other ways to connect yeah like how, how does it fit into my life and yeah why, yeah i've yeah. got like finite time you know we talked about it earlier like i've got finite time why should i spend it here right and there was a podcast that i listened to from the have you heard of the podcast tech won't save us that was this guy paris marx he started o over covid i i'm just diving it into myself but they they did a a review of the metaverse and whether it, it they should kill it <laughs> as soon as Mark Zuckerberg launched it. Yeah. And I guess like they were just kind of saying it's like this VR as a solution for community and connection for the general population has been this like ideal that tech CEOs have like chased after for, you know, two decades now. Yeah. And felt like maybe at the end of 2021 VCs needed something to pump their money into and you know them being like so uh seeing the world through their eyes and no one else's eyes were thinking like let's try this again mm -hmm. <laughs> you know like let's try to get people to want to be in a virtual world and maybe some certain types of introverts or people with social anxiety that would prefer virtual world connections would mm -hmm. like to also believe that everyone else will like it too and that just doesn't make for business right yeah and it's I mean, with regards to facebook too like i think they they made an unnecessarily large bet on it like i i think they could have proved or disproved their their hypothesis about the uh appeal of of virtual reality and, and of a uh, metaverse well, far far less money but then that's where it comes back to like was this a pr ploy right but that's a very expensive one yeah and um also like they hurt themselves in any form of adoption by only building it for for Oculus. Yeah, I think that's going to be a big problem. Um, like, even if they had a um, less compelling version, um, mm -hmm. uh, it would at least get people showing up. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like, we can't spend all day with an Oculus on. Like, mm -hmm. you know, one of the nice things about smartphones is that, like, you can take them with you. 
Right. And, and, and if you want to check in somewhere when you're, you know, in an airport uh, waiting area, in your boarding area, and you're like, well, I'm just going to check in on this or that. Like, if you don't have that opportunity, then you're obviously not going to do it. So. Right, right, right. Um, so before we change the topic and talk crypto and fintech, I wanted to take an interlude to talk about a shared experience. Um, from the mid two thousands, you hosted this vodka tasting contest. Oh yes, I've been thinking about it a lot because I have been writing uh, and pursuing the development of a scripted TV comedy drama mm-hmm. following a young lady engineer pursuing greatness in Silicon mm-hmm. Valley in the mid two thousands. And this vodka tasting contest always stood out to me. And I think it's so hilarious. It made it into act one of the pilot. So (laughs) you bought test tubes. You bought racks. We made it double blind. So no one knew which vodkas we were tasting. Mm -hmm. Can you recap your kind of either favorite memory or takeaway or lesson learned from that experience. Yeah. Uh, so one of the takeaways, um, and this is actually a good segue because I actually repeated this at, uh, at Linden lab. Oh, we awesome. did, we did, a, <laughs> we did a work event and I don't know, like 30 or 40 people showed up and <laughs> we just did it again. Um, that's so I amazing think, because we were trash. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think one of the takeaways is that like people are willing to drink alcohol for stupid reasons. Yeah. <laughs> but this felt very yeah. intelligent. Yeah, like, we it was a rigorous test. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you 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 add the veneer of science on it, and 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 it gets even more fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. So two things kind of stand out about that one is so, that so i've actually done that now well i haven't done it in quite a long time but um uh i've hosted an event like that you know half a dozen times or so um it's always fun uh people are always astounded by the results although i've done it enough now that i can actually definitively say what the top three vodkas are mm-hmm. and um uh people actually take it surprisingly seriously yeah. <laughs> they're like they'll take the little test tube and they're like is that a five or a six like, how do i rate this yeah so so in the in the um in the script uh i uh, definitely have all of the seriousness uh captured and I pump it up for the comp comedic effect because everyone gets very drunk trying to give Mandy advice about mm-hmm. what she should do about her startup um, <laughs> at the time. So um, I remember what the favorite vodka was from the time I came. And that was Kettle One because I continued to only order Kettle One for the next like decade. Yep. Uh, I was like, that is the best That is <laughs> on science. That is that is one of the, the consistent top threes. Okay. What else are the other top two? Let us know. So when we did this at, at Linden, um, we had, I don't think we did like 10 or 15 vodka. It was a little. 30 to, I mean, that's a lot. I would try to keep it still at like eight yeah. or something. We did like 10 to 15 vodkas and there were like 30 people testing. How do you collect and all that data efficiently? A wall of whiteboards. Oh, okay. That, I mean, that's sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, because we did it in, in, in the company kitchen and it's sort of like just an after work event. And not only did we like have the, the, the tasters, but like it attracted a big crowd and people got very invested in the results. Um, and uh so people bought like some really fancy vodkas like someone brought like a two hundred dollar french vodka um and people uh, my manager god bless him showed up with joke vodkas which was like a half gallon of like uh smirnoff and uh 
Gordon. Oh, okay. We definitely <laughs> like, had Smirnoff and Stoli art mm-hmm. when we did it together. Yeah. Um, and uh, when we did that tasting, uh, we're tabulating all the results and we're like reveal, you know, we're we're unveiling <laughs> the names of the winners, and we're 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 going up up the list and um, uh, Stoli was I think four. No. And um, Stoli, it's best value for your buck. It, it's never a winner. But we weren't comparing prices. I feel like Stoli was at the bottom of the list. Interesting. Well, I guess if you put Gordon's in the mix. <laughs> so so then we go up and, and number three when we did it at Linden was, was Kettle One. And Kettle One, so Kettle One and Grey Goose, they're always top one and two. Um, and, uh, and, and they sometimes change depending on who's tasting but th- those are, are consistently quality and we get so so i think kettle one was was number three in this one and then all of a sudden people started to realize that like um we hadn't revealed gordon's yet and it was it came in like the the top one or two shut and, up and and we revealed the the thing and uh gordon's came in number two out of all of these vodkas People liked it the best. Um, this and, tells and, and, me less about Gordon's. It just yeah. tells me that well, your we, coworkers have horrible. It, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. It's a right. very affordable way to find out, though. And then it's I think, so uh, <laughs> uh, and then I think the winner was Grey Goose in that one. I, if I remember correctly, maybe Stoli was in the middle of the pack. Smirnoff was definitely near the bottom. Yeah, Smirnoff's terrible. I think our group, and and granted. The Linden Labs one you just told us has a higher end, 30 or 40 people. Yeah. Um, we probably only had like eight of us or yeah. eight vodkas or something like that because we each brought our one bottle. Yeah. And um, I remember Grey Goose being in the middle of the pack, like five mm. or four. And we were like, wow, this is like the most popular vodka, yeah. the most well-known vodka. And we all put it right in the middle. And no. Kettle One was at the top. I don't remember what else we had. Sorry, you actually just reminded me. It wasn't Grey Goose who won at Linden. It was Hangar One. Oh. So, yeah. Okay, that doesn't surprise me as much. Yeah, and not only did it win, but it won by a huge margin. Like, I wonder why, where Tito's would rank, because Tito's is now know. the vodka du jour. So maybe next time I come back to the Bay yeah. Area, we we'll, can... We'll get the game together. I do actually still have the... Uh, Test tube rack. At least I think I do. <laughs> They're in a box somewhere, but I'm pretty sure I know where they are. All right. I am so glad we got to re- re- rehash that story. And another time, I'll probably have to get uh, you know some other you and some others mm. on on the phone to talk about uh, the taco crawl because I still mm. own that website. I will not give it up. So. Um, uh, all right, so switching to crypto because we put a check on Metaverse. What's going on with that? We're like, mm, we're it's still not sure. Crypto, a little more into the general adoption, the, the general pop. Like if mm-hmm. we're talking about that bell curve again, uh, like 10% of people, I think I saw, own some form of crypto. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why I thought maybe you would be the one to like convince me to purchase crypto, but you're a skeptic and yeah. one of the best critical thinkers. So I kind of want to know what your ish is with crypto. Yeah. So segue uh, from the metaverse into crypto. Um, it does look like one of the primary ways of trading digital goods in the metaverse is by leveraging crypto transactions. Is that crypto or blockchain? Probably a combination of the both. Uh, of both, um, the uh, um, and, maybe and, since- and I get that. Um, but when I was when I was doing my my research on what Facebook's metaverse thing was all about, um, I saw that and I'm like, I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea. And here's why: Are they making the user adoption curve even higher for themselves? Like exactly, metaverse as a virtual world is high enough. Metaverse with Oculus is even higher. Metaverse with Oculus and crypto to finance it. Yeah, I think they're they're like they're going too big. Yeah, 
right? They're good. They're, 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 this go big, go home. It does not apply here. Don't go big here. Yeah. Um, so with regards to blockchain, I, I think it is, that's a useful technology. And I think we haven't quite uncovered all the use case for it. Um, but, you know, anytime you need to keep a verified record of things, like it's, it's not a I'll bad I'll give you a technology. great example of blockchain, just because we're trying to make sense of things for people. The, the blockchain, generally speaking, gives us like a singular, un- indisputable record of something. Um, one of the tech star startups I got to work with uh, is a kid labs is a ticketing provider and everyone heard about the big fiasco with taylor swift tickets and there's nothing more painful to artists than to find out that most of their tickets because of the ticket master deal gets snapped up by secondary providers and resellers and then they can make a huge markup and the artist one doesn't know who their end end ticket holder is and their the, who their audience and customer is, but two, they don't make any money off of that sale. And so Kid Labs is ticketing on the blockchain. The interface has nothing to do with blockchain. So any random person can go buy a ticket to an event and they have no idea that they their ticket is on the blockchain. Um, and that like the artist and managers and, you know, um, can the event host they can then track, you know, have a direct relationship with the, their audience and and the ticket holders. So that that's just a general application that I think is something that might help people understand mm-hmm. um, the blockchain and how the that ticket can now be followed if it yeah. gets resold. Okay, so back to it. Blockchain useful technology. Crypto. Yeah. Uh, so, so like you, uh, I've been skeptical. Um, um, I have spent a minimal amount of money, uh, just to check it out. Um, I would, I would say that I make bigger bets in Vegas than I do on crypto. Mm-hmm. It, it, frankly, I think the odds are better in Vegas. Mm. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't get it because, it, because, you know, kind of like we were talking about the metaverse, what problem is it trying to solve? Like, why can't you just use regular old money? Um, and maybe if we haven't seen how much credit card companies and um, tr- more traditional like financial institutions um, have made this easier, but like, why should I send someone crypto rather than Venmo? Right. Like Venmo is something I understand. Venmo, I think, is super useful. Um, but like, there's a bajillion different currencies out there that have extremely wild fluctuations in valuation. And um, it seems to be rife with a lot of fraud. And this is like user fraud, not even talking about like the institutional fraud we saw with uh, uh, FTX. FTX. Okay, yeah. great. I don't. Don't even know them. And and you know, say what you will about banks, they are at least regulated. There are right. laws that they follow. And right. and um uh your deposits are FDIC insured. Right. But like your crypto is not cool. Yeah. You're like I, I I don't I just don't get it. Like I don't understand why. Um what what the innate value of it is. It's not, like it's not easier to use. It's not it's um, harder to use, right? Because you yeah. have to have like a wallet on an external USB because you don't want it to be on the internet for anyone to steal. This is I think that's what I get. I, I don't I could be I think yeah. I'm more green on it because I just have like put a time out on crypto yeah. from the very beginning. Uh, Because it fits so many Silicon Valley trends that I have seen, like, come and go. Yeah. You know? It's, I mean, like all things, it has value because people think it has value. But I think what we also 
saw was when people stop thinking it has value, it just evaporates, you know, overnight. And, right. and you know, it was supposed to be safe. Like it kept being sold as like, you know, safe from inflation, safe from like, uh, eco- you know, other economic woes. But like, no, it's directly tied to it and frankly exacerbated by it. Was it a Ponzi scheme by the people that originally created it? I don't think it was intentionally set up that way. I, I think some of the user frauds who would spin out like their their own little currencies and pump them up and then cash out when they uh, when it reached the peak. Uh, I think some of that uh, would have elements of a Ponzi scheme. But honestly, it was just like uh, my impression of it is that it, it is a bunch of exuberation, a bunch of excitement. But if you really, really press the people who are super into crypto, they really, I, I've just yet to hear an answer. It's like, it is solving this problem. With the big exception being, if you want to buy stuff that costs a lot of money without actually transferring cash that the government might pay attention to, it's an okay alternative. <laughs> it's an okay alternative. And, I like and, and I'm like, I feel like this is satisfying a pretty, pretty niche market of people who are perhaps not but super dis- trusted to begin despite with. Despite that, some random bodega in West Philadelphia has a crypto ATM. Yeah. I- I'm like, how did that happen? That, that seeing an ATM in a random part of West Philadelphia, a very provincial city, not a very wealthy place either, mm-hmm. you know? That, I was like, did I miss something? Because I watched it on the rise. And on the rise, five, six years ago, whenever it was, I was like, I don't know where this is going. And I was skeptical of just like it being a hot trend. Like, to give you context, in 2003, I worked on a virtual reality project, and we're still debating whether <laughs> it makes sense 20 years later. Yeah. So, like, yeah, so we'll, you know, so I see crypto, I'm like, this is a fad. Then I have a founder I worked with who's basically like, yeah, I funded my startup for this year by selling my crypto. I made like, 30, 40 grand, right? So he was like a super early adopter that took advantage of the popularity mm-hmm. going up, right? Yeah. Good for him. I'm happy. Yeah. By the time like I was like, mm, maybe like, okay, I'm a homeowner and the most risk I have is being self-employed, which is pretty freaking risky. I don't know that I want to add this level of risk to my financial portfolio. So then And maybe I was being scared and playing it safe, or maybe I was just being a good investor saying, like, I don't need this risk in my profile. But when I saw the ATM, I was like, did I, like, did I, did I pull a hood over my own head? Did I miss something? Yeah. Well, I mean, but I think that is also kind of indicative of where, like, it's kind of a hallmark of a bubble though, right? Like when, when you start getting people who are initially skeptical or, or people who just didn't know about it, they start hearing people talking, everyone's sort of talking about, but no one understands what's going on. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been around long enough to really become skeptical of these. Um, I, I don't know if it's a fad per se, because maybe there'll be some use for it, but um you know, if you look back at like the bank runs in the late 1800s, uh, before the United States currency, and, you know, before the U.S. had a central bank and could guarantee some of this stuff, like it was frankly just as bad. Like it kind of recreated that. And as, mm-hmm. as cryptocurrency has grown, what basically because it was hard to use, and because the exchanges were decentralized, but was so volatile like they basically went and reinvented banks and then when fdx yeah. fell you know fell apart they're gonna reinvent federal regulation and i'm like <laughs> like guys we've got all of this <laughs> um, is is there anything in fintech that you are excited about um i think there's a lot of a lot of potential still to make things um 
better and easier to use. And it kind of depends on on where you how you define fintech. Um, uh, my time at Capital One uh, was actually pretty neat. Um, you know, we were we were working on a mobile app um, to basically help um, parents and their children have meaningful conversations about money. Um, because what we the, the the product research basically said, kids, particularly teenage children, you know, they're starting to get money. They're they they may have a part time job. Uh, um, they they maybe want to save up for stuff, but they don't understand how some of it works. Oh yeah. Like like how how does interest work? What does in, what does investing in something? You mean? could say our student debt crisis in the U.S. is fueled by yeah. a lot of people that just don't understand how that works. Um, and the flip side of it is that parents actually really want to have these conversations with kids, but they don't know. So kids, kids didn't know what questions to ask. Parents didn't know either how to start the conversation or they, they didn't even know the answers themselves. Um, so we were working on an app, basically, which is like uh, a way to monitor spending, but also like do transactions between family members. and. Um, uh, it was really geared towards um, creating that, that level of transparency, but also being able to offer you know, a certain amount of like uh, guidance and instruction and being like, mm-hmm. you know, this is, this is how interest works and stuff like that. There's also a big like company interest in getting oh, yeah. children involved with a yeah. bank yep. really young because... Let, they stick, they tend to stick to that bank for the like rest of their lives. So. Yeah, let, let's also not not pretend that there wasn't a certain amount of self interest on Capital One. Of course, of mm. course. Uh, but they were doing, I think, a, a, a meaningful service there, um, and I think um, that's the sort of thing that technology can enable. Right. Um, so that's good. I also think you know AI and machine learning has big in the has been big in the news lately with Chat GPT. Um, there is a lot going on, um, not really behind the scenes. It's just, it's not well publicized, um, because it's not, it's not sexy, like, but, um, AI and machine learning are, are starting to be applied across financial institutions to probably for like fraud detection. That was the uh, first one for, and, uh, disputes, uh, Right or like flagging disputes, like if you accidentally get charged twice for the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did some time at American Express, and so disputes was a big thing as yeah. well for us, as well as fraud. And I could say that seven years ago, seven eight years ago, everyone assumed we were able to do these really really smart calculations, but the infrastructure for a lot of these big banks is fairly old. So just yes. because they have the information, because they have the data doesn't mean that they have the information and insights to act on. So mm-hmm. are, what are, are you saying that some of these bigger companies are starting to leverage, be, start yeah. to leverage this type of technology to get better at it? Yeah, um, 100%. Um, uh, partly because fraud costs banks and credit card companies a lot of money. So anything they can do to combat that, um, it also makes them come across as the good guys to their customers because like, oh, it looks like your card might be compromised. Um, let's take care of that for you. Mm-hmm. Um, it also, to be honest, each of those phone calls mm-hmm. to call in about fraud or yep. dispute costs at least 2 to $5 a pop. Yeah. Right. And yeah, and a lot of that is getting automated. Um, you know, Capital One now. Um, they do a great job. Well, yeah, they do do a, a good job. And they'll they'll uh, either text me or if you have the, the um, app on your phone, uh, an alert will come up and you can take care of it. Like, oh, no, I bought that. And you know, every once in a yeah, while. Yeah, you can I'll do like, it right in app. I've, I've done it. Yeah. I, I think as far as tech sophistication, Capital One is, is pretty solid. There's there's some things I noticed because I'm originally an ING direct user mm-hmm. that I talked about this in a different ish <laughs> episode of Make Sense, so I won't go back into yeah. it. But um, any other uh-huh. trends in, in tech? Uh, so I think the other thing that's happening is um, kind of what Doma is doing, and, and they're doing some real interesting stuff too. Um, they're you know they're a title insurance company, but they are leveraging um, machine learning 
uh, to basically speed up the title insurance process, to speed up the underwriting, to come up with um, uh, a risk assessment for a property. So uh, for context, for people who don't know, title insurance is generally uh, required by the, the lender for the home buyer to, to purchase. And um, it will typically add between three and seven days to your closing date. Mm -hmm. and, and DOMA's goal is to get that down to under a day. Um, and, and the industry as a whole is still very manual. Um, but there, it, it, the machine learning models are actually pretty accurate. They are able to identify, like basically DOMA says, what's our risk level? Like what, what are, where's our limit? And if it's, um, if the, uh, guess that the, the reliability uh, of the model says now we're like 99% sure that this is safe, then we're like, great. D and done in five minutes rather than five days. Have they, have you guys done the research or the testing, the quality testing where like you look at the model, and, but you also had a human do it too, to see if they came out similarly? Yeah. But, um, so my team is actually working on a on a related problem, which is related to um, uh, email ingestion. Because there's also a bunch of email. Like, if, you, if anyone who's bought a home, you're gonna get like 30 emails from your escrow agent, your yeah. title insurance company, your lender, like everything. Right. Um, and uh, for most title insurance companies, those um are all read by a person. And one of the things that we're doing is trying to either make sure that they don't like if an email doesn't need to be read by a person and we can just automate that we do but if it does need to be read by a person we're trying to get it read by the right person as quickly as possible mm. and so and yeah some business process optimization too which honestly it has huge uh time savings um and yeah. cost savings yeah um, and yeah, there, there's that feedback loop where we see uh, like an email come in, we know what decision we took. Um, and then what we look for is to see if that email got reassigned to someone else. And every mm. time it gets reassigned, we're like, what did we get wrong here? And Interesting. Then, then yeah. We, so that's how you're training the, model, the models, right? Um, and, and, and I think, I, I do think there's a lot of promise there. I think it's a really neat, like, like I said, it's not sexy. Like you're, you're shuffling emails around. But mm -hmm. you're also cutting, you know, time savings down by like 50 to 70 percent. So it's incredibly meaningful for the people that do this job. And, mm -hmm. and my sister actually is a, a mortgage lawyer on behalf of banks for 12, 13 years and um, now works at I'm not going to say what the company is or does, but enough close enough to what you just described that I am going to share <laughs> <laughs> this with her. <laughs> um, I think she's like a mortgage, uh, actually a mortgage servicer, the company mm -hmm. that she works for now. She's a mortgage servicer. So maybe not where you guys are, but definitely she knows this, this place. And as a homeowner myself, I definitely know what yeah. you are talking about. It, you're talking to a girl who, what, my second full-time job was working for an a company that made software for audiologists. So I know what unsexy, yeah, unsexy really is. So. It, uh, like I said, it doesn't capture the popular imagination, but you know, from a engineering standpoint, it is really, really interesting and 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 kind of fun to to crack that nut. And it provides value. Like it's it's a useful thing. Right, right. I think any I think any business process optimization things that make people's day jobs easier and faster. I mean, we've had a great like 15 to 20 years of like, ooh, and ah with B2C startups, but mm -hmm. people at work are definitely tapping their foots being like, why are we still using this, you know, over-engineered, messy enterprise software? Mm -hmm every day and wondering when those improvements, the usability, the UI, the efficiency are coming their way for sure. All right, Chris, it's been so awesome. 
let's make a few things make sense for everyone. <laughs> so gimmicky. <laughs> One. <laughs> uh, what we're talking about with the metaverse, not a new idea. Still big question marks as to yeah. how the general population will adopt and use and leverage virtual worlds. The only thing that might be different now than it was 10 to 15 years ago is like slightly more people are open to it mm -hmm. than before, <laughs> maybe. And hopefully it'll be, be a little easier to use. Um, and, and, <laughs> and it's been around so long that it's also probably not going away. Like right. I, I don't know if it'll ever become popular, but it probably won't go away. Yeah. Um, uh, crypto, jury's still out as well on that one. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's safe and it's totally okay to still be uh, uh, bearish on crypto. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot to still figure out around it and the, you know, day-to-day -day applications of crypto still up in the air. Yeah. And um, enterprise employees were working tirelessly <laughs> on your behalf to help improve your workday software. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, any last message for anyone? You know, ju ju just a, a reminder to give Gordon's Vodka a chance. Give Gordon <laughs> Vodka a chance. <laughs> Talking tech on Gordon Baca with Lindsay. All right, so thank you for listening to Make Sense with me, your host, Lindsay Tavis, and guest, Chris Foltz. We hope you enjoyed our takes on crypto, the metaverse, and Baca. If you want to consider, you want to continue to be considered the smartest person in the room, please subscribe or follow for next week's episode. I'm definitely in the early days, so every subscriber on YouTube specifically makes a huge difference. Google and YouTube are running ads on my videos, and because I do not have a 1,000 subscribers yet, I don't make any money off those ads, so hit subscribe. As always, check out all the links and resources in the show notes, and if you want to put in a request for how to host your own vodka tasting party, put that in the comments. We're only going to offer it if you ask. Thank you for having me. That's all for this episode and cap catch up with you next time. Thank you, Chris, for joining me.